again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're still in confused state, so it's absolutely fine. So let's start at the beginning. Okay. So when you cue somebody at the beginning of Tadasana, not the beginning, but the beginning of a sun salutation, and you cue, lengthen the tailbone, tuck the pelvis, whatever cue it is, what happens to the pelvis in that sun salutation? Like just a bog standard Ashtanga sun salutation. Okay, what happens? Okay, so we've gone cue the pelvis, tuck under, right? Then we fold forward. So what is happening to the pelvis then? Cara? Like I tried it just before I went on this chat actually again, this like tucking the pelvis and then trying to fold forward. And it's impossible to fold forward with the pelvis tucked from like the hinging at the hips. It's simply not possible. I can tuck the pelvis and then round my upper back down, yes. but I won't get very far. So that's super fascinating. So, so this, is the, this is always my point, is that I really feel that yoga teachers cue in very, uh, most cues are done in very, very basic poses, but are thrown out of the window when it comes to moving, interlacing, pose to pose to pose, or the pose becomes harder. Then it just, nothing gets taught at all. So, it's, so we, if we cue that lengthening the tailbone tuck, we can do that, as Ava says, if you're doing it for a specific reason. But there is no protective reason that you should be cueing a tucking of the pelvis, okay? It, it, because it, it's, what will happen to you guys if I cue tuck pelvis? What, what, what will be engaged? Because you're all in anterior tilt, pretty much, except for for death. If I cue... Bum and tummy. Bum and tummy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So pretty much you're going to be squeezing your glutes to start that off, but you're going to be engaging your abdominals, right? Okay. If, I mean, that's what you're going to be doing. And that's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not going to protect you as you go. Okay. You know, everybody, I'm going to make you stand up a lot. Now stand up. I hope you've got space in front of you. Tuck the pelvis. Okay. Feel your abs working. Right, tuck the pelvis. Now arms up, Uttanasana. Right, now keep that, your abs engaged and fold forward. Keep your abs engaged. <laughs> Cara, is there anyone doing it right? I can only see, I can see thighs. Yeah, so that's exactly, all right? Keep the abs engaged and fold forward, okay? So what, what do you do instead in yoga, okay? So you start off going tadasana, lengthen the tailbone, tuck the tailbone, whatever it is that you want to do. And then what do we immediately, what do, we immediately do? Okay? So we go lengthen the tailbone. There's my tuck. You see, there's my tuck. My thumb sticks out so it doesn't look like I'm tucking. Tucking. There I am, I can't even get my arms up right. And then if within a second, the person is gonna swan dive because we don't roll forward like this in yoga, right? So I've tucked the pelvis and now you're saying dive into Uttanasana. I do this. So what happens to my pelvis in order to get down? You go so into a posterior tilt. So, no. <laughs> okay, so the minute is don't over, look, this is really tricky stuff and you don't need to know it in these, in these absolute. I don't care what your pelvis does, it just moves the way it moves, right? What I want you to understand is that if you cue a tucking and lengthening of the tailbone in Tadasana, before you go swan dive into Uttanasana, the minute the person starts to swan dive, they are no longer tucking the pelvis. Like that, in one second, they have moved out of not tucking the pelvis because they want to swan dive. So their pelvis has gone, ah, I want to swan dive, right? And then in order for them to get to the ground, so we've gone from 
flatten the, think of it, lumbar spine, flatten the lumbar spine, right, in Tadasana, in your tuck thing. Then I'll get you now, Emma. We've gone flatten the lumbar spine. Then we've gone lengthen up swan dive. Then we are arching the lumbar spine. And then we're going down to the ground. And by the time we get to the ground, what has happened to the spine? It, yes, for dose, it's, got, it's, it's gone into a curve, right? Okay, then we go step back plank. What's happened to our spine? Ava. It depends, but then also again, Q to posterior. A lot of people do that. Okay, so forget, from forget the anterior, they should be a little bit back. Forget about that there's a cue, okay? Just literally go, you've only given, because what happens is most of the time you get one cue, right? I'm talking sun salutation here. I'm not talking about like hold a plank or protracted plank, but sun salutation. So you've gone from, you know, lengthen the one cue, lengthen the pelvis, arching to fold forward, but by the time you get to the ground, you've grounded, then you step back into plank. What, what's your plank do? The dose. Then you're straightening out your spine again from that rounded position. Straightening out your spine. Then you are learning to chaturanga and into Urdhva Mukha. What is happening to your lower back and your pelvis? I like the drawings. Yes. Don't worry about the tilting. Okay. And then we go into downward dog. What happens to the pelvis? Yeah, okay, this, but what, what <laughs> I know this is the downward dog shape. What's happening? What's happening to our lower back? Think lower back. Think lower back. What shape is our lower back in? I hope my lower back is not in that shape for dose. <laughs> okay, so, so what shape is your lower back in? In downward dog. It will round a little is what I was showing, right? Like what, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what, I mean, I've said this in the, what is downward dog if we flip it so that the person's sitting? Dandasana. It's Dandasana and just, it's Dandasana, well, it depends on your downward dog, but it's Dandasana leaning a little bit forward. So in one sun salutation, and then remember nowadays we do a whole load of other things. See, we can throw in crescent lunges and where the pelvis is moving in different directions. And the lower back is changing. So your one cue that is a protective cue, perhaps, if it's for a different reason, that's a different thing, a protective cue is immediately undone the minute they dive into Uttanasana. Do you understand? Okay. So, and is, is, is that bad for the lower back? No. Who's saying no? I mean, Lauren. <laughs> Lauren, oh, there you are. Because it takes a while for the yellow thing to go, to move around. I'm like, woo, who's talking? <laughs> so, my point is, I want you to understand that the pelvis, it's, it moves for a reason, right? It's moving because the teacher has said, lengthen your tailbone, inhale, dive forward, okay? Because it's doing, it's, it's working out, I need to go there, right? And it's doing a particular thing. And in yoga, okay, can anybody tell me what it's called when, actually, I don't even know, you don't even need to know, okay. So in yoga, when we stand up and we dive forward, we generally, the, the, what is the instruction with the spine that people give? Straight back. St straight back. I don't know who's speaking again. Lauren again. Sorry. <laughs> Lauren again. Oh, you see there. It so straight <laughs> back, right? Lengthen the spine. Straight back. Generally the instruction. Okay. What, what, how is that different from picking something up? Off the floor. Normally, you would bend your knees and roll your spine down a bit, so you're going to flexion. Okay. Yeah. How many people bend their knees all the time to pick stuff off the ground? No. Yeah, that's no. right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> in theory, not in practical. <laughs> you know, it, it's just not practical. It's, you know, you will definitely do it if you've got a back injury. But, you know, generally we don't sort of squat down to the ground and pick something up and then squat up back up again, right? Okay, we just roll down to the ground with straight legs. So what, what is the difference? What are we adding in in yoga? And why? We adding hamstrings. Absolutely, that's a very good reason. But let's keep it just spine. So let's keep okay. spine. what are we trying to do with the spine in terms of our swan dive into Uttanasana, our length and spine. Yes. I would it not be back to load again with the arms on that? Um, depending where you have your arms. <laughs> Okay, could be, but why do you think teachers cue length and spine, Ava? Um, they will, if they want to, they by that way they will also tr um, strengthen the back of their bodies, the the, the back muscles. Yeah, so they strengthen back. But again, I come to the question: Why do yoga teachers cue length and spine? I can almost guarantee it's not to strengthen the back muscles because most of them don't know. Anya. And is it to create space? Actually, I think that's probably a very good answer. It's a, I think we have this thing as yoga teachers that we like this long, quite flat spine. That's what we look for in downward dog and things like that, right? So it's a, we think that there's space in, in that, I think. I mean, I'm an expert, I'm, every yoga teacher is different, Ava and then Caro. So I don't know, but maybe they do it because they want to keep neutral back more or less so that the low back is not neither overarching in uh, like Tadasana nor over flexing uh, or over rounding uh, going down. So probably they think it is bad for us to do one or the other. So they want to keep the spine yeah. like it is. Yes, absolutely. Perhaps. Um, who is next? Sorry, I've forgotten Kara. Um, I feel, uh, in, especially in Germany, there's a lot of discussion around this um, connected to herniated discs. So if you bend forward with a rounded spine, you're going over time to work towards a herniated disc or any other disc damage. And it's really like a, you know, like action <laughs> to do. Um, one yoga teacher said it once to me, um, because um, I talked to her about this one student who was like in Pashimottanasana really pulling at the feet and you know as soon as you say something like that it's like oh okay well herniated disc is waiting for you so I think it's very much connected to to this yes I, I think there's I think varying degrees of that that it's a spinal flexion it's really being so we do so this idea, think about it in two ways, and this is what I was hoping you would get from the videos, is that so when we're in Tadasana and we're in a mostly anterior tilt for most people, so we've got a lumbar arch, which is, we've all got a lumbar arch, hopefully, otherwise that would be a problem. Okay? Then yoga teachers tend to think, okay, that's problematic, lengthen the tailbone, don't over arch. Okay? So that's one way, but whoo, you know, the spine's overarching. But then when we go into forward bends, yoga teachers don't want us to overround. There's this idea that the spine should be kind of straight wherever. So not too flat and not too, uh, well, actually, no, straight <laughs> if possible. You know, that, that because I think it comes from the disc injury, Caro, I think, anyway. I think it's funny because, you know, in anatomy, you learn about the S curves of the spine, but it seems like as soon as it comes to teaching actual poses, many yoga teachers tend to forget about that. And when they hear like a neutral spine, they automatically think straight, but the neutral spine still has the curves. So. Yeah, I think there is an element of that as well. It's, I find it a lot in cues for down dog. With people are yoga teachers are always getting length in the spine and you know that kind of language around spine straight spine in downward dog and I mean and it does feel feels great for me as well but there is some kind of idea that the spine being straight and not having those curves is 
better, maybe, I don't know, lots of different kind of explanation. So what do we know if we are, um, Lauren, do you want to ask a question? I just wanted to um, add to that. So I think it's because, so because we inflection so much on the rounding, especially as we get older, we want to minimize that and prevent that. So as we get older, we want to keep opening the chest and to do that, we need to kind of straighten um, or not straighten because you always have curves, but trying to not flex all the time because you're flexing your whole life. You're sitting, you're driving, you're eating, you everything in flexion. So I think that's why we always want to lift the chest or lift the spine. Possibly, but then I would say to you, what, what is the predominant category of poses that yoga teachers teach in general, in a general yoga class? What's the main category of pose? <laughs> I love Fado, she just does actions, okay? It's, yeah, for, the all thing, it's forward bends, right? I, I think, on the, uh, on the whole, I think we teach forward bends. I mean, I don't know what the percentage is, but I don't think many people teach back bends, maybe a couple at the end of it, but mainly forward bends, right? Even our arm balances, a lot of them are kind of forward bending kind of thing. And what shape is the spine in, has to be in, Unless you make people not fold fully forward, what shape is the spine in in a forward bend? Flexion. Full flexion, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like your, your spine in a forward bend is in full flexion. It's like a completely rounded shape of the spine where all our curves, including our cervical spine, our neck spine, go into this dropping the head curvature. And I think that's our predominant state in yoga right it's our predominant state in life for those Catherine you're never gonna hear a class where a teacher's gonna cue round, like go down with a rounded spine I mean when they say round your spine it's normally when they want to eat like do this sorry that's terrible you know what I mean do that um like maybe if you're in a goddess squat and they're asking you to open and close you'll never hear them saying fold forward with a round spine no one says that my, my challenge would be more to say why do we have to say anything yeah. <laughs> you know it's like it's you know I, I definitely agree that if somebody has not got flexibility of hamstrings that if you're folding forward and they you know they literally their pelvis is not moving into anterior tilt at the hips so it's not fold, that we've got your hip points here and you fold forward like that they they not because of their hamstrings then number one they're feeling nothing in the forward bend that you want them to feel because it's a hamstring pose and they won't feel anything and you need to fix that right you do but everybody else you know the people that are just sort of out you can get in iyengar yoga they cue all the time lift and lengthen the spine and they will have you lifted working your back way 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 hard but then they'll always squish you at the end anyway you know but so it's it's there's a range of things but i can't i can't forward bend if you don't let me round my spine that that's what I'm trying to get is that we cue these things that will actually prevent what we've asked the person to do. If that makes sense, even if you've got super flexy hamstrings, Taryn. Um, sorry, I just wanted to ask then, like with relating to that, then with a swan dive, would you still cue to fold forward with a straight spine, but then kind of let it slide if people are folding forward but their spine isn't neutrally straight uh, if that makes sense so they still have a tilt in, in their spine but that is their straight spine um would you still would you still forward, say that that's folding forward with a straight spine um because i watched this video that was like saying that when people tend to swan dive and you and over arch their back and then they're going with force downwards to the forward fold, then it's like actually bad for the hammies, um, like you're stretching too deeply into those. So I don't know if that's, I just wanted to ask about that. 
I personally, I, most people, I mean, some people can, depending on their flexibility of their spine and the strength of their spine. If, so the best way of exploring it is going forward to half Uttanasana and then having your arms out front or behind you and feeling what the spinal muscles are doing there. And they're working to hold you up. And when you're on your way down, they're working eccentrically. So they're working so that you don't smash on the floor. So for me, yeah. it would be, First of all, it would be, I like that because it really works the lower back. And I'm not saying anybody with any kind of injury, it would be helpful for, but generally as you know, I find that people don't work their lower back muscles. So in swan dive or chanasana, rather than a roll down, I would find that their lower back suspending the mid air would be still in a little bit of an arc. Some people maybe loads, depending on like someone like Laura has got massive back flexibility but that their muscles would be working to hold them, which is kind of a good thing. So I, but then, you know, if we're going from that half Uttanasana, the folding forward slowly into a full forward bend, then it, the shape changes. So you would be going from a slight curve in the lower back and then the lower back, everything has to curve down at the ground. It's got, the vertebrae just have to change on the way down. So, I don't see it as injurious and I'm not saying for everybody but as a general thing I think it's more for me I like I would I love swan diving slowly okay so I'm not a I'm not a fast mm. teacher I don't teach like this so I would be much more I would stop people halfway and make them hold and then go down to the count of 10 9 eight. so it, I would work it differently because it for me it would be much more important to strengthen both their lower back and their hamstring muscles by adding load slowly on the way down. So, so again, one of my very long answers to your question. I don't see it. No, that's perfect. Injurious. Thank you. Um, I see fast vinyasa as potentially injurious because frequently people haven't been exposed to the load, progressive loading. And so they kind of just falling into poses. And yes, that can definitely tug a bit on the hamstrings, those kind of things. So yes and no <laughs> sorry Jaren, it's very does it does it help at all <laughs> that answer yes definitely thank you okay. so um, i think it's it's very much in the speed of things and the queuing of just going fast through motions not really being aware of what you're really doing you're just going because you need to kind of catch up to the teacher and i think that's maybe when things start to and I think the thing is, well, going back to our very early conversation, that when people are doing fast vinyasa like that, and they're doing predominantly just forward bendings, but folding forward, then they're not, nothing's been strengthened. So the tendons haven't mm -hmm. had any exposure to tensile loading. They, and so they just, everything's just being like horribly pulled. It's too much, too soon, and too fast as well. Is, so that I do think can yeah, definitely happen. For Joe, you wanted to say something? Yeah, sorry. I think this will take us a little off track, but I just have to ask because it came up in what you were saying. When you say I'm not a fast teacher, um, what, do you still consider yourself a vinyasa teacher or do you describe yourself differently? You can answer me privately if you want. No, I don't care. I, I, for days, I'll teach anything. It's, I, it, list, my background, Shivananda, Ashtanga, Iyengar, vinyasa, a whole load of movement science, body weight work. <laughs> Yeah. Everything. I'll put everything in if I think it works for a sequence and it works anatomically. It's like, and if I want to do, you know, if I if I advertise something, advanced vinyasa class, it's going to be an advanced vinyasa class, but it's not going to be endless sun salutations with no meaning. It's going to be definitely linking poses, but not in a. Um, I'm slower and hard. I, I'm much more into strength-based stuff, and that includes within flexibility as well. So I work like that a, a, a lot. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Because I just think that yes, associated. Happy do a, a workshop. I'm happy do a class where I make you do everything on blocks. You know, it it just depends what what I'm actually teaching. Okay. Back to pelvis. So now, what I want to know: we know what the pelvis is doing in forward bends, right? We know what the it's going forward okay so and the spine is rounded right so then i want to talk about back bends what's happening there when we stand and go backwards what is happening 
Posterior tilt. Okay, posterior tilt where? What's happening to the lumbar spine? Let's keep it just spine because it's very difficult with the pelvis. What's happening? Extension. Extension, so it's arching, right? Okay, so what is our cues in back bends that we hear again and again and again? Isn't it the same thing? Lengthen the tailbone. Yes, so lengthen the tailbone. So lengthen the tailbone. If we're standing in Tadasana and we lengthen the tailbone, what happens to the tilt, the depth? I don't know if you want to answer that question or is another one. Uh, no, it might be linked because, you know, saying that today, when I, even when we're just doing chair and, um, you know, putting your, your um, sorry, let me just think about this, uh, lengthening the tailbone into posterior tilting, I can't go into a back bend. I'm stuck. I feel like my lumbar spine is stuck. Like it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay. I almost have to let the hips go, yeah, the pelvis tilt forward in order to get more of a back bend and more of, ex, yeah, ex, extension, spinal extension. I don't know if I'm right, but that's what it felt like to me. But, but that's the absolute best way to feel this thing. So often when I teach this module and we do, it gets more and more complicated when we go to core and then spine and all of those things, is that it's counterintuitive because the pelvis works in, it, go, it, it can anterior tilt and go forward, it can anterior tilt and we can go back as well. So it's, it, it's a tricky little thing. So Caro, you wanted to say? Yeah, I think it's kind of the same as with, bending forward if you tuck the pelvis and straighten out the lower back you're taking this part of your spine out of the bend be it the forward bend or the back bend and i feel i mean i can bend a bit back tilting uh, tucking my pelvis uh, but i will feel it a lot more in my legs actually so it makes my legs work a lot harder and i can't it misses this kind of like a bit of spring or bounciness. I mean, it's not like I'm throwing myself back, but maybe you know what I mean. This kind of like being able to move with the breath in the band and have it more like fluid. So it makes it more, yeah, stiff. Okay, so, this is it. so if I'm on my knees and I'm about to go into Ustrasana, camel, and I do a posterior tilt. I lengthen, let's forget about the tilts because it gets very confusing. I lengthen the tailbone and I lean back. What shape am I going to be in when I lean back? My straight back. back. Straight back. I'm going to have a straight back. I'm going to be doing, I think they're called reverse Nordic curls. Okay. Well, I'm going to be dead straight going back if I have the tailbone lengthened all very good it's a great quad exercise that i highly recommend it okay but if i want to go into ustrasana what do i have to allow the lower back to do arch what? sorry to you arch. need it to arch to, uh, to arch because what what is a back bend extension of the spine extension of the spine okay that's it. So does everybody understand this? That so if I posterior tilt, so we go back to Tadasana, if I posterior tilt, like a significant posterior tilt, and I want to go into a back bend, I'm going to be stuck. Because as Caro says, it feels like the lumbar spine's all stiff, like you've taken it out of play because you have. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's just, but you're just going to create a different shape. You can't create a, a back bended shape without having the lower back in an arch situation. Okay, does that make sense? Does everybody understand Catherine. that? It's like you have to allow that. So, the lengthening, if I'm in bridge and you've just gone up into your bridge the way you go up into your bridge, you've interlaced your arms, and if I say, lengthen the tailbone there what will happen to the shape of the bridge it will go more straight your back it will go more straight your back so you might be working different stuff right you might be and these are really good things to do for different reasons to get more glute work to get a less arch in your spine because your spine's not feeling that happy with one today etc etc so but those cues are going to change shape Right? For those, did you want to say something? I just saw a hand. No, okay. So those cues are going to change the shape. 
and that is fine but as yoga teachers we have to know that that we can't just say oh lengthen the tailbone in a bridge or in ustrasana or any of those things without understanding that if the person does it's probably going to change the shape of the leg if i say lengthen the tailbone in bridge compared to length the tailbone length the tailbone in full ustrasana what's going to be the difference in the response from so it, to a structure. You'll, you'll feel it more in the thoracic spine. So if you say uh, tug your tailbone and then you go into a back bend, you feel it more in the top of your spine. So it depends where you want, if you want the arch to be in the lower spine or the top spine. I see what you mean. And yes, it could absolutely be, be like, sorry, I have to listen and figure out what you guys are saying. So, so yes, it could actually be that. that but what I want to know is, is it going to be easier for me to lengthen my tailbone in bridge or in ostrasana? Bridge pose. Why? Less load. <laughs> Love you, Lauren. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's perfect. So it's that classic thing again that we cue things. So we can cue lengthen the tailbone in tadasana. So we can all do that, right? And then we cue lengthen the tailbone in bridge and we can all kind of do that but then when it starts to get to the harder things like ustrasana where we're hanging back it becomes a harder thing to do then what happens in urvajanurasana taking into account not the big backbenders of the world of which there aren't a lot they're like normal people like me in a backbend what happens to my backbend if you tell me to lengthen my tailbone my urvajanurasana you can't I sort of can, <laughs> but what, what, it, what, will, what will happen to the shape? If, if I don't have flatten out, won't you? I will flatten out, okay? So, and that is sometimes a fabulous cue, especially if you're working privately with people that are big backbenders and they, and they niggle and they, you know, then sometimes you can say like lengthen the tailbone because it does flatten them out. And sometimes that's actually a good thing depending on who you're working with. But for the majority of people, if I flatten them out, in an Urvadhanyarasana, it's going to feel, Fidoz is shaking her head, it's going to feel terrible. What are you going to feel, Fidoz? Because I know what your shoulders are like. I think you'll probably, yeah, you'll be carrying more on your shoulders, but I'm also wondering, will you feel something in your, in your lower back? Because I'm just imagining flattening out, I might, I might have to do it while you're in a wheel pose. And then if you flatten it out, won't you be carrying more in the lower back area? Not necessarily. Again, it's one of those things, I think there's a slide where, you know, we cue glutes and things in bridge and then it, it, there's, um, she's measured it biochemically where she's shown that, you know, if you cue glutes, then glutes takes more of the, the load, et cetera, et cetera. So it may or may not be, but generally what will happen is that it, for somebody without shoulder flexion, I mean, not without shoulder flexion, without great shoulder flexion, their wrists are already taking a bit of strain because they've got to be at a radical angle. And if I flatten out, their wrists will take even more strain. It, it's going to reduce their shoulder flexion because they want to be, they're using. So what happens to the ribs if I cue lengthen the tailbone? What's going to happen to my ribs? Sorry, Lauren, and I think Ava, I can't see you, Ava, it's dark, but I think you had your hand up. Uh, Emma, are you putting your hand up as a little finger? Or you just pointed? <laughs> so it's, it's quite ch challenging the hands and the things. Emma, so and the, then the Emma. ribs will obviously move. Oh, wait, Lauren's talking. <laughs> Lauren, you Sorry. go, then Emma, <laughs> then Emma. So if you say that your ribs will tuck into the body because you then you're activating the core as well. But I also just wanted to ask you so I, I especially with people with, so I have a bendy back like a very bendy back and love back bends. Um, and I feel that when I don't have, and it's not like a strong tuck, but like if I don't engage my glutes a little bit, I feel like I'm crunching into my lower, my lumbar spine. And then I have less of a back bend in the top spine. So I, I like to cure it for people like me. Hey, Lauren, you've gone a bit weird with your Wi-Fi. I just feel it's safer so that you don't really engage into my glutes. 
Okay, so uh, you, well, you cut out, but I think we've got what you're saying. So that's exactly what I'm saying. With people with excessively bendy backs, it can be a very useful cue for them. I don't want to say glutes because glutes, I'm a big fan of glutes, okay? Big fan of using glutes for everything. So, but with people with, a, with very, very bendy backs, and you can see them, they almost have a hinge point around T12, L1, depends where, whatever. It may be a very helpful cue to not take them far, especially if there's niggles going around or it feels unstable. So absolutely, it's just that very, they, in a normal yoga class, what percentage of people do you think have very bendy backs? Not a lot, in my experience. Anyway, 95% don't. So it's, but it's definitely a valid cue. It just shows it's different for different people. Emma, sorry, you've been waiting. <laughs> um, sorry for the, like background today has been quite a busy day here again no. so um, <laughs> so i wanted to say a few things um firstly i want to go right back to the beginning where we were talking about doing a forward fold and the swan dive when you bring your arms up um most people have got tight lats and your lats originate from your thoracolumbar fascia from your iliac crest and then it detaches onto your arm so when you lift your arms up in inevitably everybody can go into like an extension right you um, disappeared oh where's she there you oh. are <laughs> sorry you just <laughs> over there yeah <laughs> yes so um so when you're queuing lifting your arms over the top of your head for whichever reason a lot of people are going to go into an anterior tilt and have that what well excessive lumbar curve mm. um that's what I wanted to say about that. Now I've got to remember what else I wanted to say. <laughs> what are we talking about now? <laughs> Guys, this is my brain today. Lengthening the spine. Lengthening the spine. In, <laughs> in, in like big back bends for back, very back bendy people. Okay. Um, I like what you said just now, Catherine. You were talking about, okay, we, we also have to remember, I come from an injury background. Yes, yeah. I am trained to find fault in people's movement. So everything, like all those cues, it's like, it's like a typical physio type of cue. And, and uh, it's put onto the general population, right? So when, I, I like to explain to people, your back is a, is a closed kinetic chain. Not just your back, but your back, your entire spine and your pelvis. So whatever affects the one part is going to affect the others. And we do naturally have our S curves and we always kind of want to maintain them, but everything can move. Some parts of the spine move more than others. And in big back bends, when somebody has a tighter thoracic spine, which most people have, and we can't, and we'll get, I know that we'll get to the spine. <laughs> um, no, and yes. yeah, you, you don't have a lot of extension in your thoracic spine. So you're going to look for mobility somewhere. And a lot of the time, exactly as you said, Catherine, your mobility comes from T, um, T12 L1. Um, that's where we find lots of, especially what I'm seeing quite a lot of yogis get pain around there. Mm. Uh, or like in specific spots. And usually that's where they're hinging in their back bends. Um, so... Um, what did I just say? Lats, lats, length plays a big role in this. And when we're arms are over the top of our head, if we're going up into, uh, into wheel, also our lats range can cause us to hinge in certain areas. <laughs> So basically, that's what I want to say. I can actually talk a lot about this. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing. So, it's a, so, but the point is much more about can we cue for that? Like in a class, can we actually cue to protect people from injury if we are trying to get them into Urdhva Dhanurasana? It, it's yeah. you know it's a so if, if if whether it's lats or whatever it is if your shoulder flexion is restricted but you're actually encouraging the people to do urdhva danyarasana they are going to have to use those other areas of mobility so it's so for me in urdhva danyarasana because my shoulder flexion is just barely 180 i have to really let the ribs do a lot of work for me and I have to use every single area of mobility, but it feels fine. The only place it doesn't feel fine all the time is my wrists. You know, that's where I feel it. So my, my question with all of this is like bringing it back to yoga. It's like, do, 
can we teach those poses then if we have to cue to protect against potential injuries and people going off to physio that that's the because we're making them do these crazy shapes you know in a yoga class sorry ava yes I'm, and that's why i think that the peak pose sequencing is so genius because you can see or assess people before you send them into the big pose because you prepare for that pose and you see what's happening and if you then bring in Emma's considerations, if you see what's happening in their spine and if you see they have tight legs and if you see that they will probably not be able to go that far or whatever, then you can go to that person and either tell them to work on, on the last to uh, next to last step or to just chew like cue for their lumbar spine to cue for the tilt and tell them that they can't expect to get into a really big round um, wheel maybe it's wider and maybe you help them with uh, props for their wrists and whatever so that is that is the good thing in the people sequencing because you can combine both things the the thing that you can't just cue like wildly into a room with people that are also different um, but you can see the individuality while developing the pose. Uh, yes, that's true. And then, but it's, and again, it comes with experience teaching and knowing your people as well. So it's like, you know, I know, I know Laura, I've taught her for years and years and years. I know exactly what to cue for her back in back bends. Okay, she frequently ignores me, but you know, because <laughs> she wants to do the big back bend. So it's a, so we can we can cue for that. We can adapt, and as you teach more and more and more, you can see what works with people. You know, but something like Urdhva Dhanurasana is is such a complex pose that if you're going to teach it to a room full of people, it is very difficult unless you've got extreme experience to go. Okay, that person needs that. That person's got short arms. That person's got terrible shoulder flexion. That person's got long, uh, sorry, something wrong with their wrists. The proportions are different. That person's got really long legs and short arms, et cetera, in Urdhva Dhanurasana. So it becomes really complex with pelvic tilt. But then that's a good note. I think we've got to end, yeah. A good note to end on because what I then, we have to go right back to the beginning and go maybe if we can't cue properly in Urdhva Dhanurasana for everybody, we shouldn't be cueing a certain thing in Tadasana and then throwing a portion to the wind at the end of it. Okay, guys, go. Sorry, I, we went over. It was a big conversation. Um, I want those videos by Friday that I can't remember what I asked you to do, but whatever I asked you to do, send it to me, please. Okay, bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.